My name is Tommaso Gori of the University Medical Center Mainz and welcome to your intervention. We're here to discuss two uh, papers presented or published this month in Euro Intervention. The first discussant is Dr. Kochka of the Charles University in Prague and the second discussant is Dr. Diletti of the Thorax Center in uh, Rotterdam. Um, the two studies focus on a special indication of uh, uh, bioresorbable scaffolds and this special indication is ST elevation myocardial infarction. Now, the first question for Dr. Dilete is, um, ST elevation myocardial infarction are a special indication for anything. What is the rationale of using BVS, especially in this type of patients? Well, uh, lesions in acute myocardial infarction are usually soft lesions, easy to dilate. And uh, we know that we need a very good uh, scaffold expansion to have optimal result at follow-up. So uh, this kind of lesion could be easily treated with BVS with a good expansion. This is a first, a first rational to implant BVS in this kind of, of patients. And also BVS was observed to provide a, a stabilization of uh, uh, acute plaques, of uh, unstable plaques, by providing a thick uh, cap of the of the of the plaque after bioresorption, so is providing also a sort of a stabilization of these acute plaques. Uh, finally, it was observed, it was hypothesized that the wider strata of the BVS could entrap more thrombus between the scaffold and the vessel wall. And for thrombotic lesion, this could be very important because when we are implanting the BVS uh, or the bioresorbable device in general we could have less embolization. Of course, this is a theoretical mechanism and it should be demonstrated. But these are three good points to implant a bioresorbable technology in acute myocardial infarction. Now, the second question is uh, the selection of patients. This is a big debate in, uh, in the use of BVS in general, uh, in all type of patients. Now, in your study, uh, you uh, treated during the same period of time 580 patients and you ended up implanting BVS only in 117 of them. So apparently you use selection criteria. What are those selection criteria? Uh, those selection criteria are basically the entry criteria for a Prague 19 study. And the inclusion, we have included every patient who had a STEMI less than 24 hour old and signed informed consent. But the exclusion criteria were much more broad because we wanted to exclude all patients who were in poor clinical situation with no potential to survive long term and therefore derive the benefit from the bioresorption. So those were patients in shock and patients with poor cooperation, patients with significant comorbidities. We also excluded patients who could not take prolonged DAPT, prolonged dual antiplatelet therapy. And from the angiographic criteria, we had a very strict criteria for the vessel sizing. We did not want to implant too small BVS absorb into a larger vessel. We also intended to use only one scaffold for patients. So if there was a long lesion, this was exclusion criteria. And there were some other angiographic criteria to keep it simple, basically. So what about sizing? Because this is also debated in the setting of STEMI. I believe that the sizing in STEMI is crucial. There is a spasm, there is a not always possible to, to, to give the patient the nitroglycerin to vasodilate the vessels. So we have always tried to slightly oversize. So if we were, from the practical perspective, if you were in, in your mind in doubt that, that whether this is a 3.0 or 3.5 vessel, we have always selected the bigger one. If there was any doubt in my mind that the vessel is between 3.5 and 4, that was exclusion criterion. If it was more than 3.7, the patient went out of the study and received a 4.0 metallic stent. Now coming to, to the procedural aspects of the, of the implantation, in your paper you see a difference in the outcome of patients treated with BVS based on the use of post dilatation. So you basically see an incidence of complications or uh, outcomes after um, during follow-up of 3.6% in patients treated with BVS and post dilatation and 6.8% almost double as much in patients not treated with post dilation. Now in the setting of uh, uh, STEMI, post dilation is felt by many as being an extra risk factor. So how do you see it? Yes, I, I must say that what, what I do usually when I treat a STEMI and I implant a BVS is to leave the BVS implantation as the really last part of the procedure, the last step. So I like to prepare the lesion and to clean the vessel as much as possible. 
And in this, in this regard, I also uh, still use quite, quite often thrombus aspiration because in this specific setting with, uh, with BVS, I like to clean the vessel and to, uh, to have a good visualization of the size of the vessel and uh, with, without thrombus there. So this, this could also have an impact on uh, uh, distal embolization. Uh, post dilatation, of course, could uh, give um, some embolization of uh, thrombotic material down in the vessel. But what is uh, really important with this device is to have a good expansion of, of the device. And also, uh, we have the, mechan the theoretical mechanism of the uh, thrombus trapping between uh, struts and vessel. So it really needs to be well evaluated if post dilatation could have. Uh, an impact on the uh, distal embolization when we are implanting BVS. What we know now is that we need to well expand the device. So it's really important that we make sure that our device is well expanded and we can make sure uh, that is expanding having a, a adequate post dilatation. So this is a key factor and we have seen this with uh, respect of acute uh, events and also long-term events. So the, uh, we, we had long-term events associated with malaposition and this could have been corrected with, with uh, adequate post-dilatation. Great. But a longer um, procedural time or longer procedures and more complex procedures during the implantation of BVS as compared to a drug losing stent prolong the time of the implantation, prolong the, the procedure and make everything more complicated. Is STEMI not a setting where you really want to be out of the room as soon as possible and out of the coronary as soon as possible? Especially at 1 a.m. Uh, <laughs> that is correct. Uh, that was, uh, we did not, because of the selection criteria which we had, and because the STEMI very often is a proximal lesion, uh, we typically did not see any big issues in delivering the stent. We were able to deliver easily 97% of the absorbs, so that was not a big issue. The big issue in our case was that because of the research purposes, we wanted to do OCT. And doing OCT in over 50% of our patients in the acute setting at 1 a.m. in the worst case scenario uh, was not something which is always easy to do. It, uh, the staff does not always enjoy that very much. But I think it was, we have learned a lot by that and I think it's good if we want to study scientifically correctly, study some new technology in the new setting, then getting the intravascular imaging I think is important. So in practical life, I don't think it was a big issue for us. Uh, we also post-dilated about 30% of cases. Now, the post-dilatation is a funny thing. In the beginning, when we started using BVS Absorb, we were told no to po not to post-dilate because of the possibility of the strut fracture. Then we are moving to a advising everyone to post-dilate everything. And I think the truth might be somewhere in the middle of the road. That's absolutely true for everything that we do, <laughs> basically. So yes. summarizing the, uh, this short talk, um, why should we do it? What is the rationale for using BVS in the setting of uh, ST elevation myocardial infarction or in the setting of acute coronary syndromes? In general, those are biological diseases. One has to keep it in mind all the time. They're not mechanical diseases. Thinking that uh, a mechanical therapy, like just putting in a stent and quickly being out of the room is enough to treat this patient over the long time is very, very, very simplistic. Uh, those patients need a therapy, the plaques need time to stabilize, to passivate, as Dr. Diletti and Roberto uh, said. And the best thing that you can do to those plaques is probably just implant something that then disappears and is not there anymore. One, there has been much discussion in the last times, in the last years, after the publication of the GHOST paper, about the safety of those devices in this setting and in other settings. And those two fellows tell us that even in the most complicated setting, in the one, the one where the patient is the most fragile, the one where everybody wants to be as quick as possible, taking the time really pays. And those devices are absolutely safe, even in the worst case, in the most complicated uh, scenario. So thank you very much. And uh, I wish you a productive day in the cat lab with, with your bioresorbable scaffolds. Thank you very much. <laughs>